Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon, or, or this afternoon that is in Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, a different time of day for some of the rest of you uh, uh, TAFE talks. This is the second of two sessions that we have been doing on apprenticeships. Let me begin, though, by acknowledging in the spirit of reconcili reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we are all meeting on today. For me, that is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay respects to elders past and present and extend respect to emerging leaders and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in today's webinar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny Dodd. I am the CEO of, of uh, TDA. And I welcome today a group of speakers, but firstly, let me set the scene. So in the last few weeks, we've been focusing on apprenticeships. Two weeks ago, we had a session where we welcomed uh, the new Mining Alliance to present along with Western, one of the Western Australian tapes on innovation fast-tracked apprenticeships, a stimulating and really interesting presentation for those of you who are pre present. Today, we're focusing on what does it mean to help apprentices complete? We all know in the TAFE sector that it's not so much about the provider and the student, it's very much about the relationship between the, the apprentice and the employer. But nonetheless, as providers, we have a significant role to play in that. I think it was also very timely that NCVR released uh, last week their, their research report on issues in apprenticeships and traineeships, and they identify five pain points. And one of those pain points is completion rates. So today I'm very pleased to welcome five speakers. So we've got a pretty packed agenda. We'll begin with a presentation by the Assistant Minister, the Honourable Luke Howard. Luke, in his own words, is a product of the TAFE system. And he is, the, uh, he is a minister in, holding in the electorates in Petrie, which covers Brisbane and Moreton Bay. He has done a series of courses principally through what was then Brisbane North or North Point, I think it was called then, which is part of now of TAFE Queensland, the Diploma of Business and the Certificate Three in Pest Management. We'll come to the Assistant Minister in a minute. We will then move on and we'll hear from Ben Barden, who is the CEO of the National Australian Apprenticeships Association. Ben's had a very long history in this sector and many of you will know Ben. He's been both a CEO within RTOs, he's also been responsible for employing apprentices. So he'll speak today from a very deep history of working in the apprenticeship system. He'll be followed by Diane Dayhew, who is CEO of the National Apprenticeships Employment Network, the GTO network. Diane too has had significant history in the vet sector. Diane has been, was involved with SIPSIC and the New South Wales ITAB, at one point in her career and has been involved with apprenticeships for some years now. And then we're going to hear from Tiffany Blight. Tiffany is the Executive Director for the National Careers Institute, which as you all know, is part of the National Skills Commission with a real focus on careers and what it means to have an apprenticeship as a career. So we, we welcome and thank Tiffany. And then finally, we'll bring it all together with a TAFE perspective from Taz Tafe, and, and many of you know um, Grant uh, Drahiv, which who is from, who is the CEO of Taz Tafe, and Grant's going to talk about what it takes to really try and hone completions. And I think uh, Taz Tafe has been quite successful in what they have been able to do. So let's begin. I'm going to hand across now to the Assistant Minister. Thank you very much. If, uh, before you start, Assistant Minister, if anyone wants to put in questions, we hope to have a bit of time during the air, at the end for questions. Use the Q&A, please, uh, in part of the Zoom. Thank you, Assistant Minister. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. I uh, appreciate what you do to here and uh, appreciate the invite to talk to everyone online today. Thank you for the acknowledgement of country as well. And uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to chatting to you. Feel free to type any questions for me in the Q&A and I'll endeavour to get back to you where I can. Uh, my name's Luke Howarth. I'm the Assistant Minister for Youth and Employment Services in the Australian Government and also the Federal Member for Petrie, as Jenny said, in North Brisbane, Moreton Bay. 
I work in the Department of Education, Skills and Employment in the Australian Government, along with uh, Minister Stuart Robert as well, who is the Minister for Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, as well as Minister Tudge, who's the Minister for Youth and uh, Education, and as well as Minister Bridget McKenzie. I wanted to start by saying today that Australian apprenticeships contribute to growing the pipeline of skilled workers for the economy and TAFE institutes and public providers are important training providers for Australian apprenticeships with almost 45% of all apprentices and trainees, some 157,000 plus students as of the 30th of June currently studying through TAFE. As Jenny said, I've done a number of courses through TAFE over the years as well and have a fond experience. You left out, Jenny, I did do a food and liquor course years ago when I first left school. I didn't know what I wanted to do and uh, I did a food and liquor course at Bracken Ridge TAFE and uh, I think the movie Cocktail had just come out so I thought it was a good idea to do it at the time. But I ended up getting into the hospitality industry and then I worked in retail and then I worked in sales before running my own business and then I went into parliament after that. But whether you are an employer, a public provider, part of the Australian Apprenticeship Support Network or TAFE Institute, or even a youth specialist, or perhaps a high school guidance counsellor, you share one important goal, and that is getting the best results for young Australians. We can all play a role in encouraging young people to take up an Australian apprenticeship as a meaningful way to get training, employment, and to gain a qualification and getting the right support in place to help them successfully complete them. Young people aged 24 years and under, particularly that youth cohort 15 to 24, make up over 65% of apprentices in training, 65% of apprentices in training, and young people make up 62.3% of total completions across Australia. This offers vital independence for young people who can move forward with the ability, the ability of course, to direct their own life, pay the bills, cover the costs of living, everything that they want to do, buy a car, save for a home. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has been challenging and hit young people particularly hard. And I thank you and everyone online in this sector, uh, public and TAFE institutes and those who work with youth, thank you for your commitment to helping young Australians succeed. I share this commitment as the Assistant Minister for Youth and Employment Services, and as someone with three sons of my own that are 15, 17 and 19. It has been heartening to see young people who have continued to take up opportunities and navigate training and the supports available to them. As of the 5th of November this year, just last month, apprentices and trainees aged 24 years and under make up nearly 83% of all apprentices, assisted by a package worth $2.8 billion for supporting apprentices and trainees measure. So as of the 19th of November, apprentices and trainees aged 24 years and younger also make up two thirds of all the boosting apprenticeship commencement registrations under the $3.9 billion program, the Boosting Apprenticeships Commencement that the Australian government's been running. As most of you would be aware as well, uh, the, the economic impact of COVID-19 has hit young people particularly hard because they tended to be in hospitality, tourism and casual type roles. And it impacted their ability to continue and complete their apprenticeships. And, also reduce the offering of apprenticeships places due to the economic uncertainty with closures in different states, lockdowns and so forth that have been particularly hit hard in Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. I meet a lot of young people in my role, uh, met with people this morning, young Australians this morning, and many tell me that COVID-19 pandemic resulted in them moving back home, uh, relying on gaining part-time or casual work and has impacted on their mental health and well-being, which is concerning. That's why the government as well, uh, during part of our economic response, has been to invest $2.8 billion in the supporting and trainees wage subsidy, uh, which has helped employers to keep their apprentices and trainees in training 
during the height of COVID. We've also done the 3.9 billion boosting apprenticeships commencement, which I mentioned before, that was announced back in October 2020, and it's ongoing to March next year. And then there's a $716 million completing apprenticeships commencement program, which will continue to support for BAC recipients into the second and third years of their apprenticeships. The $2 billion job trainer fund also provides support to the younger apprentices. And it's a 50-50 partnership between the Commonwealth and the state and territory governments to deliver additional free or low fee training for job seekers and young people, including school leavers in areas of identified skills such as health, aged care, disability care, IT and trade occupations. Mission Australia's youth survey today uh, mentioned that over 20,000 young people showed 45.7% of young people said COVID-19 was an important issue due to its negative impact on participation in activities, education and mental health. And the government also recognises the non-financial support is just as important for ensuring young people take up stay in and complete an Australian apprenticeship. Really important that they complete it. Australian apprenticeship support network providers play a frontline role in supporting young apprentices, particularly those at risk of dropping out. Schools, of course, also play a role and offer a pathway for young people to take up an Australian apprenticeship and uh, students can complete an industry developed training package or an accredited course either in their school or in partnership with an external provider. Secondary school students may also commence part-time Australian school-based apprenticeships and traineeships in school, which allow young people to start their vocational training, earn a wage and get a hands-on experience in while finishing school. As of the 31st of March this year, six months ago, there was 22,810 school-based apprentices. 22,810 school-based apprenticeships in training, which made up 7% of all apprenticeships and trainees. Australian apprenticeships, of course, is only one pathway across the government's skills and training portfolio designed to transform youth employment in, as the economy recovers. Young people can be encouraged to take up an apprenticeship pathway through schools and other programs, such as the new employment services model, the Skills for Education Employment Program and the Government's Transition to Work Program. In conclusion, promotion of pre-apprenticeship programs through these services can increase the likelihood of successful transition into and completion of, of an apprenticeship. And I know that many of you here online today have local activities underway where you partner across services to tailor assistance. And I want to thank you for that on behalf of the Australian government. You also support individuals and help young employed people, unemployed people, sorry, back into work. So I'm sure I speak for everyone online that we're all really dedicated to youth. Thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you having me speak to you today. Happy to answer any questions that you put in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Minister. We appreciate you being with us today. We, um, we absolutely agree with the importance of uh, the apprenticeship uh, pathway for, for youth. And we also acknowledge how much TAFE does in those critical licence trades, in particular, yes. in terms of apprenticeships, where we have the bulk of the market in, in uh, electro, technology, in plumbing, and, and so much in so, so many of those providing such a critical pathway, perhaps less so in the apprenticeships, in the mm. traineeships rather, more, more in the apprenticeships. And thank you again, Assistant Minister. And I do thank encourage you. people to put questions in the Q&A if they have them. Let me now turn to Ben and Ben, uh, ben Barden. Thank you, Ben, for taking us through your perspective. Thanks, Jenny, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm talking to you from Wiradjuri country today, and uh, I extend my acknowledgement to um, uh, elders past and present. Um, let, me, let me share my presentation if I can. Okay, 
Um, so I wanted to reflect on the obstacles that apprentices face and the role that um, TAFE can play and the TAFE sector can play in um, supporting higher completion rates. And when I was thinking about um, uh, when I was thinking about uh, the possible obstacles, uh, they really fell into four main chunks. The first was, are there uh, perhaps there aren't enough training places available? Um, we've had uh, eight years where the numbers declined, and as the assistant minister just described, there's been a renaissance, a revitalization of apprenticeships in the last 18 months or so. And, um, uh, and that's a really rapid increase for any system to have to deal with. Uh, the second possible obstacle, I guess, is um, uh, thinking about, is the training that we uh, deliver flexible enough? And, um, and perhaps, uh, is it a cause of people dropping out um, because they're dissatisfied with their formal learning? Um, the, the third obstacle is um, uh, people of our vintage uh, on the panel, um, you know, in misunderstanding or trying to understand where a Generation uh, Z come from, uh, the digital natives who've never lived without the um, internet. And um, I gave the three versions, I think there are six, of um, how, diff uh, how uh, Generation Z um, can sign off as okay. Um, okay, neutral, okay. Uh, really rather strongly uh, underlined. Okay, uh, uh, all good. Um, and do we really understand the drivers and are we supporting them in the best possible way? And then uh, the fourth obstacle is, um, are we creating a fair deal for apprentices? Um, are, are we delivering on all the elements of the training contract and ensuring their obligations are met? So let's just have a look and um, uh, Assistant Minister Howarth, um, charted this out really nicely that we've had the supporting apprentices and trainees measure, we've had the boosting apprenticeship commencements measure, and now we've got the completing apprenticeship commencements measure. Um, this is a little bit backward we're looking, but it gives you a sense of the growth in apprenticeship numbers over the last uh, year in particular. Um, and um, you can see in the 13 months to November 2021, um, we had 229,000 commencements. And so what that means in terms of in training levels is that in less than a year, we've gone from 270,000 apprentices in training, uh, our total stock of apprentices and trainees, to 380,000 as it is now. That, that's our best guess. Uh, the numbers obviously uh, feed through from the um, NCVER with a, with a three to six month lag, but our best estimate is that it's about 380,000. Um, and we've got more to come because the uh, back, um, the boosting apprenticeship commencement measure finishes on uh, the, the end of March uh, 2022. And uh, there, uh, prior to the end of any significant measure like this, there'll be a peak as people rush to uh, get access to the 50% uh, wage subsidy, which is incredibly generous. Um, Following on from that, the completing apprenticeship commencement measure will flow through till 2025. And so um, uh, there's really good support over the medium term. And I think this has implications for TAFE um, because we can anticipate higher levels for quite a, quite a long time. And of course, we're uh, going into an election period next year, and this has been a really successful revitalization of the apprenticeship system. And so who knows, um, there may well be other announcements from the major parties about how they uh, intend to keep the momentum going. And let's hope that that's a focus for, uh, for all the parties. So um, in terms of my reflections on uh, the obstacles, there we are seeing capacity constraints. So some apprentices, and this is not um, by any means all of them, but some are waiting nearly nine months to actually start their training. Um, and it's because we've um, had a period of, of low levels of activity. And also it's very difficult to attract uh, trainers in plumbing and electrical because they can earn so much um, in, in the trades. And so it's a really big national issue. It's not just a TAFE issue, but the, we're definitely seeing um, capacity constraints. Um, in terms of the flexibility of training, it's very rarely mentioned as a, a reason for dropping out of an apprenticeship. So that's reassuring. And I think Jenny, you, you alluded to that at the beginning. So it's really how does TAFE fit in the ecosystem of all of those things that really make a difference to uh, apprentices and trainees, which is important. 
When I think about Gen Z, I wonder, and this is um, something which I hope, t- hope Tiff might reflect on uh, too in her presentation, are we giving um, the current generation of school leavers the best possible information uh, about this pathway? After a period where um, the opening up of uh, university places and the lowering of ATAR requirements allowed a lot more people to go to university, um, but often at the expense of high uh, non-completion rates of university where their ATAR is lower than um, 75. Um, And, are we constructing a fair deal? Um, because uh, the evidence seems to suggest that usually the a dropout is as a result of a breakdown in the employment relationship. And so I'll go to that now. Here are a couple of graphs from uh, the NCVR uh, research report that um, Jenny referred to at the beginning. And you can have a look here. This is the first, uh, the top reasons for not completing an apprenticeship. And um, it's about the job. The, the top, the top um, five reasons are all about the job. I left my job. I lost my job. I didn't get on with my boss. I got offered better work. And I uh, um, didn't enjoy the, the conditions. There's nothing there about the formal training. This next one, and I'd encourage you to go and read the report. It's backward looking. Uh, It's sort of looking at the last 20 years of research. And so it doesn't have um, elements of the last um, uh, of the period, the COVID period, but it's got some really good um, insights. When you look at the satisfaction of people who've completed apprenticeships, it's all about the deal of um, uh, and and the completers are in blue, if you can see that. Um, it's all about, did we deliver on the deal that they learned the skills that they needed on the job, if the integrated work-based learning model? And um, so where you complete, they're very satisfied with the skills that they've learned. They're, they're very happy with their relationship with co-workers and they feel safe. Um, down the bottom, you can see the role that pay plays. I mean, um, uh, for those that don't complete, Um, pay, they were only satisfied with their pay about 45% of the time, 46% of the time. And so that acts as a bit of an accelerant to other workplace-based issues. I can see that I'm using up my time, so I'll skip through these next ones. Um, We're about to release a a technical paper um, on the factors that um, go to uh, the success of an apprenticeship. The ones above the line here relate to the apprentice uh, candidates and the ones below the line relate to employers. And so at the end, I'm going to give you a link um, uh, to the technical paper um, and I can email it to you when we publish it in about 10 days time. So uh, let's just summarize the advice um, and I'll finish up. Um, uh, In in terms of advice for the uh, public provider system, Uh, Be aware of the growth and anticipate further growth. Uh, This is not going to go away for the next three, five years because uh, because of the duration of apprenticeships. Um, uh, There may well be more. Uh, And um, so the workforce issues about how we get access to uh, the trainers we need um, is a really big issue. And I I suspect we need to collaborate on that. Um, I I think the focus on... uh, the focus on completions will inevitably end up as a discussion about accelerated apprenticeships, and you can see that in different forums. And competency-based progression and recognition of prior learning will be an increased focus again. Um, it was in the early part of this decade, and then um, it's it sort of waned. I think it'll be back. Um, but also some of the other implications of having a much larger cohort is we're going to have more disadvantaged young people. Uh, moving into apprenticeships and traineeships now as a percentage of the overall cohort. Uh, I think that's a really great thing, um, that uh, a lack of um, uh, particularly um, uh, uh, short-term skilled migration means that we're creating more opportunities for disadvantaged young people to take up these jobs. And uh, But it also means that first-time employers of apprentices might have a different elective mix um, because we're drawing many more uh, employers into, into the system. And, and finally, um, it would be great um, to uh, expand the kind of taster programs and pre-apprenticeship programs to allow school leavers and those still at school to have um, a try before you buy. Um, and um, uh, we know that if you complete a pre-apprenticeship, you're much more likely to, full, to complete the full apprenticeship. So I'll leave my comments there. Thanks, Jenny.
Dan, really rich information there, really, really useful. And, and um, I, I think your comment, be aware of the growth, is a really important one because it has been a challenge, in particular in some of those high licensed areas. Recruitment of trainers, if you ask the TAFE industry what's one of our big issues, like so many industries, it's about getting the right staff and, and the right people. And this is absolutely one of them. And with the growth in apprenticeships, it exacerbates that. Thank you very much. And I think you, your commentary around um, acceleration and, and so on is, is something a lot of us would like to see a return to what we truly meant by competency when we started in this, uh, in this uh, training system with competency base, which was truly about where, where an individual starts their journey of learning and uh, working. Okay, we're going to move now across to Diane. Diane Dehu, uh, over to you. Right, testing the sound. Everyone can hear me. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you to Ben. Um, ben, I learn something every time I hear you present and, and scribble down notes and new data and stats. So <laughs> thank you for that presentation. So I am presenting from... Um, none of all country and uh, and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you will work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this um, webinar today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's a great delight to be presenting to TAFE Directors Australia and um, TAFE plays such a valuable role to the group training sector. So um, very grateful to be presenting today. So um, moving on from Jenny's segue as well on key points that lead to apprentice completions, um, this is what I was asked to talk about. And uh, I just um, mostly have summed it up in a few um, uh, talking point slides. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so funny you would say right person for the job, um, Jenny. So recruitment and placement, this is something that particularly group training believes is incredibly important um, it, because a training contract is a commitment uh, and an apprenticeship is a long commitment. Um, traineeship can also be a, a, a shorter commitment, but still um, it's a contract um, for a, a young person and um, that can be quite scary. Sometimes it can be the first contract that they've ever signed. So recruitment and placement is incredibly important, we believe. The right candidate the right host employer, the right qualification, and the right RTO. That's You've just got to get it right. So we believe in group training that there needs to be careful consideration of that. And, um, and basically in group training, we provide services to ensure that you get the best quality outcome in an apprenticeship or traineeship. Next slide, please. Right, good information up front. Another factor that we really, really believe in group training, and I'm sure you would all agree, and some of this is touching on what um, Ben was talking about as well. Good information up front is incredibly important. A visible career path. Um, a, you know, you'll find that a, a, a lot of young people, when they're choosing a career, they'll choose something that they've seen. They've seen a parent do it, or they, you know, the even in retail, they've seen people do jobs. So, and they can see where it leads to. So a career path that's visible is incredibly important to a young person. Um, also the understanding of where career and life goes, life goals are and where they travel beyond the apprenticeship or traineeship. That sort of information is really important to a young person. So let's, let's think about where this could take you beyond the completion of the qualification. Being realistic about the industry and the job, will they tolerate the environment? Are they happy to travel from work site to work site? Are they willing to travel? Um, what kind of work environment do they like to work in? Um, are they happy to get their hands messy or do they want a, a, a more ordered environment? So tasters are really great. They're a great um, way of um, ensuring that the information is very visible for that young person, pre-vocational training, is something that group training really believes it's a great model to ensure that um, whoever's at the end of pre-voc pre training and has a good idea of what they're about to step into means that they're more likely to succeed in their apprenticeship or traineeship. 
the qualification is well understood. Um, so this is something that I refer to all the time, and this is something that um, that uh, a, a head of um, TAFE in um, uh, the uh, See, John, oh, can't think of his name now, but he was the head of um, uh, um, Granville Tafe of the construction unit, John Humphrey. There we go, John Humphrey. Some of you may know John Humphrey. He was telling me about the time he was taking a student of a carpentry students and was six weeks into it and someone put up their hand and said, when are we going to learn about carpet laying? So <laughs> making sure that um, the young person, and there were, I think there were some language barriers there as well in, in terms of the person that had signed into that course. So, so making sure that the qualification is well understood and additional support requirements are ident identified upfront. So you actually have a good idea of, um, from the employer's perspective and also from the RTO's perspective of what support that young person may need throughout the traineeship and apprenticeship to ensure that they succeed and, and you can remove those barriers. Next slide, please. Now, I just think it's really important to think about the apprenticeship and traineeship journey through the eyes of the young person. And I know Luke um, said he has teenagers at home. Um, I've got teenagers of, at home as well. How many adults, um, how many adult relationships have they had whilst they're at school and, and who are they with? And who are those trusted relationships with? Generally, they're with teachers, they're with parents, they might be with a soccer coach and, and so on, but they are limited. Most of their group is, um, their, their relationships are with their peers that are all doing the same type of um, uh, education at school or in their um, competitive sports and so on. But the, the relationships with adults are quite limited. Next, next um, slide, please. Right, so this is now shifting the conversation about pastoral care from group training. So if you think about the transition of a young person, they, they go into a, a, an apprenticeship or traineeship if it's directly from school into a world of adults. It's a very big shift for them. And suddenly they're in the adult world. Um, they've lost their trusted um, relationships that they have with their teachers. Their parents aren't around so much. They're, they're needing that. They still do need that parental type of relationship or an advocate to ensure that they um, that success, can succeed. Um, I know many, the vast majority of apprentices and trainees are employed directly with um, a, an employer. But the, in the apprentices and trainees that are employed through group training actually have a dedicated field officer that provides them with pastoral care. And the pastoral care, care that's offered through group training is about a relationship. It's a consistent relationship that goes from the beginning of the apprenticeship and traineeship right ideally through, through to the end and helps that young person to navigate all those transition points that are presented to them in an apprenticeship or traineeship. So I like to refer to group training as a, as a body that um, carries and connects and moves that young person through all those different connections. Um, so it's a reliable relationship. It's a new responsible attachment. It's a go-to person, um, someone to ask questions um, that they can't ask um, their workplace supervisor. And it, if, if that young person struggles um, in a group training or arrangement with a field officer supporting them, um, we believe that they're more ideally um, going to succeed if they've had several chances of falling over and being picked back up again by a field officer and rather than being placed directly with an employer. So that's, that's why pastoral care in group training exists, exists. Achievements are celebrated too. Very, very important for a young person. All right, next slide, please. So I think also it's really important to think about what's going on with a young person. If they're around 18 years of age and, and with group training, most of our placements are school leavers. So for a young person, there's excitement and fear of, of the future and failure. Lots of new life decisions can feel overwhelmed with expectations, self-doubt, their brain's still developing. They're allowed into pubs and they can drink alcohol. They might be in their first relationship. They're learning to drive. They're not very experienced on the road. Um, they're changing their connections with those adults that they've had in their life for a while. 
Um, lots of, um, they're losing their attachments at school and they're looking for new attachments. They're very vulnerable to external influences and they're looking for role models. Next slide, please. So I like to think about um, the complexity of an apprenticeship or traineeship and how many ducks need to be in a row for um, a young person to ensure that the apprenticeship and traineeship succeeds and that they just even just get signed up and they can get on their feet. Um, so they leave, they've left school, their friends and their teachers, they're choosing a career path, they need to find a job and an employer, they need to um, negotiate their wages with a new employer, they need to sign paperwork, all these new experiences, things that are newly and uh, new responsibilities for them, how they're going to get to work. Do they need a driver's license? Do they need a car? Um, something that's not mentioned there is, do they have the tools for the job? Can they afford them? Will they have to take out a vet student loan? Do they need public transport? How are they going to get to TAFE? How are they going to be assessed? And how are they going to live on the wages that they're getting? Um, and, and what kind of support they'll need perhaps from home during that time? So lots of things to, um, that need to be in place for a young person. Next slide, please. So this is just to give you a, a picture of how the group training model works. Essentially, the, the group training organisation signs the contract to, as the employer. I'm sure many that you would all know that, but just a reminder of how it works. And we have separate contracts with the, tra the trainee and or the apprentice and the host business or host employer. Next slide, please. Um, if you just um, press enter again, there we go. So um, the GTO safety net. So the, the reason that group training organisations um, provide these services is to provide a safety net to both the young person, but also to the, the employer and the host employer. So um, you've got that neutral third party and so on, and the other set of eyes on the apprentices training and progress the support to a small business particularly um, that may not always be able to keep that close eye on the apprentice there and they're keeping the eye on the business. So that's just a little uh, um, snapshot there of what group training provides. So I hope this provides, um, adds a little bit of value to this discussion about um, uh, the keys to success in, group, in um, apprentice, apprenticeships and traineeships. I think really um, what we have seen though is that there, um, we believe that um, there needs to be a reinvigoration of the group training network, a reinvestment in group training um, from the Commonwealth perspective to, to really look at how group training can better support these completion rates because it's an issue that we all that, that we all share. Okay, Jenny, I think I better stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diane. Okay. And I and a little bit of a heads up for both you and Ben. Uh, if we get time, there's a question there about wages. And I'd like oh, yeah. a bit of thinking from you both towards the end, not now, if we get a chance. And also, you might also reflect a bit on the mature age apprentice in, in this uh, discussion as well. We're going to now turn to Tiffany, Tiffany Blight from the National Careers Institute, which is relatively new, although maybe less new than it was, but nonetheless, taking a vital uh, role in, in this whole sector. So over to you now, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you to the other panel members as well. Um, really interesting hearing other, other perspectives. Uh, and I did hear your question, Ben. I might come back to that at the end because uh, it's an interesting one as well. So thanks very much for having me today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the lands on which we're meeting. Um, I'm presenting from Ngunnawal country, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples attending today. So what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of background about the NCI, although we have been around now uh, formally for over a year, I think it's always good just to touch on uh, where we came from, the reason why we're here. And then I wanna talk about some of the support that we offer, including uh, what's available for current and prospective apprentices and trainees to help them in pursuing their career pathway. And I think Lyndall's running the slides for me, so I might move on to the slide, second slide, please, Lyndall. Excellent, thank you. So in his uh, 2019 review, um, Stephen Joyce, Honourable Stephen Joyce, identified some key issues in relation to careers information, specifically that there was a really big gap in the provision of careers information to help students and their families to choose a vocational pathway. There was a plethora, and there still is a plethora of websites, which cause a lot of confusion uh, to consumers. 
And it's also really, really difficult for people to find reliable information um, that they can use to make a decision about which way they want to go. So that lack of information, that timely and accurate information is leading to a misalignment between career aspirations and training and study pathways. Students relying on their friends and parents for advice, uh, and they may not necessarily have the most contemporary information. Um, and students are investing in study options that aren't going to get them to the, their best job or career outcome. So Joyce recommended the establishment of a single authoritative government source of careers information with a particular focus on marketing and promoting vocational careers. And the National Careers Institute was established as a result of that. So originally we were established in 2019 um, and with some underpinning research through that first year and the setting up for things such as the Partnership Grants Program, which I'll touch on. And then in the middle of last year, I had the fantastic opportunity to be invited to lead um, the National Careers Institute uh, in its formal establishment. And here we are today. And so we are in working very close partnership with the National Skills Commission uh, and we use their world leading labour market intelligence through all the work that we do. Thanks, Lyndall. Now, I don't have to tell you that uh, skills are needed now more than ever. They feature in all of the various presentations and um, the information that we hear coming out from government. It's really, really core to us in terms of economic recovery and growth. But we know that people are still confused about their options. And so we're trying to work towards supporting a strong and effective career development system. Um, and that's going to prepare people not only for what they're doing today, but also for the workforce of the future. There's continuing to be greater competition for labour. We're seeing that more and more, especially as we recover from the pandemic. So our career services have to be adaptive, have to keep pace with change in the education, training and employment landscape. And they need to support people as they transition through their career. Thought I'd just touch on the National Skills Commission's priority skills list in 2021, which points to the most common shortages in areas. And these include the technical and trades workers. 42% of occupations in that group are assessed in national shortage. 19% for professionals, 17% for machinery operators and drivers, 12% for managers and 8% for community and personal service workers. So vocational education and training is really important. It's an important career pathway to meeting that current and future demand in key occupations with national shortage. Improving the perceptions of VET and encouraging people to consider obtaining a qualification in vocational education and training and pursuing a career, so that includes things such as apprenticeships and traineeships, is going to be key to addressing those shortages. And that's a key role for us in the National Careers Institute. Thanks, Lyndall. So what I wanted to do is just touch on some of the things that we're doing that is helping to strengthen that system um, and also to provide that support and things that you in your roles can also lean on and draw from to help support students that you're working with. So a key part of what we do is promotion and communication. Um, I said at the outset when we stood up the NCI, we are not the field of dreams. Uh, we can't just build something and hope that people know that we're here. So it's a really big part of what we do. We want to raise the profile of VET. That's a key issue for us out of the Joyce Review and something that we're very passionate about. And we want to make sure that we're encouraging school leavers to consider their post-school pathways, including through an apprenticeship. So we do this through our engagement on the National Skills Week, National Careers Week. We're out in jobs fairs and career exhibitions. Um, we do also have a number of VET sector partnerships, which I'll touch on as well. We provide a lot of information through our websites, which include Your Career and My Skills. And I'll come back to Your Career a little bit later because I think it's a really important resource that you need to know and be aware of. And we also produce a number of webinars and we do some presentations for specific cohorts. We do mail outs as well to schools and parents and guardians in the context of our school leaver um, work. We have a partnership grants program and we're supporting some really innovative career related programs um, targeting what employment uh, employers need. Rounds one and two uh, have been selected and uh, those programs are underway and it was really great to see a number of our TAFEs feature as grant recipients or um, involved as uh, grant program in grant programs as partners. Um, round three, which is about supporting opportunities and pathways for women, um, opened on the 20th of October and that actually closes tomorrow. And we also have a fourth round that will be focused on youth and that's anticipated to open um, next month or this month, I should say. We're now in December. 
Uh, we also maintain the National Training Register, which, as you would all know, is the authoritative source of information on RTOs and their approved scope. We also deliver the Australian Training Awards and we manage the VET alumni. And that allows us to really highlight people who've excelled in VET and their pathway. Hopefully, a number of you were um, able to, to view the ATAs on the 18th of November. Uh, we had over 1,500 people viewing the event online and another 500 plus watching from various live events um, that were held in states and territories across the country. So it was fantastic. And I think even though the virtual awards isn't necessarily the, the best way of doing it because you don't get the chance to be there and actually be in the moment, it really does open up um, the ability for people to, to view that and to be involved in it. I was really delighted and um, I think Ben and Diane as well, we all had the opportunity to be judges, um, including for the School-Based Apprentice of the Year Award. It was a really great uh, opportunity because you hear those inspiring stories of school students who've embraced their apprenticeship and are now pursuing the passion for their careers. What I noticed though, which was interesting both in 2020 and 2021, was how young people view their career when we speak to people and ask them or speak to the young people and ask them about what they wanted to do, a lot of them sort of said, at the moment I'm pursuing an apprenticeship in, for one example, hairdressing, but they were already thinking and had a view to where they wanted to go next. So they are already seeing their life in career shifts and changes. So from a hairdressing apprenticeship, moving into a nurse and becoming a nurse in a, in a future career shift, so I think we really need to be conscious about how people and how young people view their careers. It's not you start somewhere and end in the same place. They're very much predicting and are preparing themselves for those frequent shifts. We also have some targeted things that we're doing. So we've got the, um, we're looking to attract Australian workers to modern agriculture through a partnership with the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. Um, that's going to allow us to build some interactive features on your career um, so that we can, again, encourage people to consider um, agriculture. And we want to do that for other industries as well. So this is the start of what, what we see growing um, to other industries too. Uh, and we also have a school leavers program, and I'll touch on that towards the end of the presentation as well. That's available to youth 15 to 24. So for students that kind of fall into that category, regardless of whether or not they're studying, they are eligible to access some of that support and um, you are welcome to encourage them to do so. So as I mentioned earlier, our information is integrated and enabled by quality career data and analytics from the NSC. Thanks, Lyndall. So we are also responsible for the Vocational Education and Training Information Strategy, um, which you may be aware of. It is one of the first Australian government-led long-term communication strategies to build awareness and improve perceptions about the broader VET system, and in particular, the many opportunities to which, to which a VET qualification can lead. So that was very much informed by market research and stakeholder consultation. And, and the, the idea behind these um, partnerships is to engage audiences which, which might be disengaged or haven't actually considered or are not aware of what the VEC sector can offer them. So some of our partnerships include with World Skills Australia. Um, we also have a partner in the National Skills Week with the Master Builders Association and also supporting and linking tradeswomen, which um, hopefully a number of you might be aware of. They run workshops in schools for women and girls on how to use tools. And they've supported many women in gaining apprenticeships and also providing support and mentoring to tradeswomen across the country. So the NCI also supports the Australian Vet Alumni, which I mentioned before, and that's a national community of vet graduates. Uh, also includes registered training organisations and schools, vet practitioners, vet leaders and businesses dedicated to sharing their vet journey. They're selected um, through their engagement with the Australian Training Awards. And so they're recognised for their training excellence and are, are viewed as role models for the vet sector. Uh, and they provide that voice um, about real, uh, relatable stories of career successes um, through their interactions with the VET system. They're at the centre of our VET information strategy and um, they're used in a number of different ways. Uh, we do engage them to come and speak in our webinars. They're featured on our various podcasts and they're invited to go and speak to schools as well because, as I said, it's those relatable stories that really inspire. Thanks, Lyndall. Next slide. 
So my last two slides, I just wanted to quickly touch on two things um, that we have that you might be interested in. Uh, and certainly I would welcome uh, you to have a look at that material and always welcome feedback around what we're providing there. So the Your Career website is our kind of digital front door uh, and that provides access to information about occupations and the training and education pathway to pursue those. Next year, we're going to take a, undertake a bit of an uplift of your career uh, with the express purpose of improving the experience. We want to be able to personalise the people that interact with the site uh, and also use things like virtual assistants to gain information from people so that we can then provide more tailored recommendations to their experience, qualifications and interests. So and one of the areas that we're also focused on is about consolidating websites and, and connecting websites to help reduce the confusion for people as they interact uh, with the, the plethora of websites that currently exist. So information on apprenticeships is one area that we're particularly focused on. Uh, so in addition to, to working through and consolidating what's available at the Commonwealth level and then connecting sites through that ecosystem, we also have some uh, funding to build an apprenticeships incentives estimator that will make it easier for apprentices and employees to understand what they might be eligible for. Tiffany, you've got to the last fairly quickly to the last one, so we allow time for grants. Thank you. It's been yeah. Great. Sorry about that. I will very quickly then. Last slide is just our school leaver measure, which I mentioned before. This is how we get some information out around all the various pathways that school leavers might take, and we have some information in there about apprenticeships. We can provide those in hard copies out to you as well. Um, so I would definitely uh, welcome your interest if you would like to have some of those too. So I'll stop there. I probably talked for way too long, but um, welcome any questions. Thank you very much. That's um, fabulous richness that's coming through the National Careers Institute, and it's great to see it all in one place. Let me now turn to TDA board member and CEO of TASTAPE, Grant Drahir, to talk about what's happening in Tasmania. Thanks, Grant. Thank you, Jenny, and thanks for inviting us to attend. Um, can I add my acknowledgement to the traditional owners, especially the Palawa people of Lutruwita, Tasmania, and the Muwi uh, people here in Hobart? I'm going to give a little bit of context about Tasmania, but I might just follow on from the Assistant Minister's comments uh, it's interesting to be talking about apprenticeships because I started my working life as an, as an apprentice chef and I started my life in TAFE as a cookery teacher. Um, so I have a strong commitment to apprenticeships and what they can do for people. I thought it was important that people understand that Tassie is a fairly small jurisdiction and anything I say, I have to acknowledge the efforts of past people because uh, I haven't been here for a year yet. Um, but we have only 540,000 people. It's a centralised system. We're the only TAFE in Tasmania with about uh, 16 campuses across the state. Despite how small Tasmania looks on a map compared to the rest of Australia, we still have quite remote, regional and remote areas that are very difficult to service. Uh, we offer our training in prior priority areas that are set by and determined by the Tasmanian government. One of the things the government has us doing a lot of is um, looking at assisting last chance learners or learners in areas where there's no other options than the public provider to go and support them. It's an interesting discussion perhaps for um, TDA for another day because I think uh, Professor Richard Teese from Melbourne University a few years back has done a lot of work around second chance learning and how it's stopping TAFE from doing what TAFE should be doing for industry. But as I said, we'll leave that for another day. Uh, next slide, thanks, Lyndall. So TAS TAFE trains around 60% of the apprentices in Tasmania. That includes trainees. So most of the traditional apprentices are trained through TAS TAFE, not all, but most of them. Interesting, there's been some talk about the age of apprentices. The average age of an apprentice at TAS TAFE is 24. And I think if you look at why we have a high completion rate, people are probably better prepared for their apprenticeship when they're that old. And that's probably due to Tasmania is very strict around compulsory year 12 completion before people can undertake post-secondary education. Our apprenticeship numbers, as has been talked about a little bit already, are increasing. They've gone up 20% in the last two years. Um, and that is certainly providing some challenges for us, especially in those traditional trade areas. And you can see I've listed some high demand areas there. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So as uh, Jenny said right at the start, Tasmania's completion rates are the highest in the country. Um, 
and I've just let people know that that's not high enough for the state government and that's certainly not high enough for industry. So there is a challenge for TAFEs and registered training organisations to, in, to increase our completion rates of, of apprentice, apprentices. Um, we, we think that, you know, Tasmania and the apprenticeship system makes a really strong contribution to Tasmania. And, and some of the training that we do and how we do it is, is, I suppose, the things that I'll talk a little bit about. So the next slide, thanks, Lyndall. So completion rates are good. Being a small state, small population, everybody knows everybody, uh, which was something that the previous CEO tried to um, warn me about when I started here, but um, it, was, it, it was more connected than what I realised, but that's a great advantage for us. Um, the regional spread, we, we have good population centres around the state where most of our apprentices are more than happy to come to and, and they treat the apprenticeship um, a little bit like I did when I was an apprentice where, where they come for a week or two weeks and stay in student accommodation if they're from out of, out of the city. And, and I think that builds up that support network. I'm still connected with people I did my apprenticeship with, you know, nearly 30 years ago. So I think it's, it's something that really helps build the relationships. And I know, I think it was Diane that spoke a little bit about pastoral care and relationships being really important for people. Um, we have really close contact with industry and here in Tasmania, we have industry that are only too happy to tell us if they're not pleased with what we're doing. And I think that's a positive thing and they'll come and talk to us about that and make sure that that relationship between us, the employer and the apprentice is, is strong and happening you know, on a regular, regular basis. We also have, port, have implemented portfolio managers within, within the Institute. So as we have a group of people who are not necessarily the teacher um, or the trainer for an apprentice, but they are the person that maintains contact with the apprentice and with the employer and make sure that the employer knows what's happening, the apprentice knows what's happening and they're prepared for when they come on site to do their um, on-campus learning and they're, they're progressing through their on-the-job learning at the same time. One thing that was um, also spoken about, uh, and I think it might have been Ben that talked a little bit about um, the support we provide beyond learning. Uh, we have extremely low literacy and numeracy levels here in Tasmania, so we provide a lot of support for students around literacy and numeracy. We have a lot of socio disadvantage, socioeconomic disadvantage, and again, we need to put systems in place to be able to support students with that disadvantage. It's a, it's a real challenge for some uh, young people who don't have the supports at home and, and we try and put supports around them and help them. And, you know, I have to pay uh, my respects to the group training system because when we're working in partnership with group training, that's a much easier process than when the student doesn't have the support of the group training company. Uh, next slide, please. So just a couple of examples and uh, Sophie Russell was our apprentice of the year. Uh, in Tasmania this year. And um, it's fantastic to see so many young women in high vis getting around Tasmania. I had a complaint from the hairdressing industry that we were attracting too many young women to construction and they couldn't get enough hairdressers. I, I thought that was a good problem that young women were coming into the construction trades. And Sophie's an amazing young woman. Um, and I think the thing there, she talks a little bit about her, the portfolio manager and the teacher and coming out on site and touching base and seeing how they're going. So it's more than just the training side of it that they're talking about. Help them through things they're having difficulties with. Talk about what's coming up when they come on to tape the next time and just let people know that they're there. And this is this relationship stuff. There's, you can talk a lot about learning methodology or pedagogy or any type of gogy you want to talk about. But in the end, the relationship between the employer, the apprentice and the TAFE, whether that's through the teacher or other support mechanisms, is critical to things. Some of the big picture things that um, the other speakers have talked about, it's critical for them to be able to be successful when it comes to operating on the ground. Uh, next slide, thanks, Lyndall. And this is an example of where I think our staff have gone, you know, above the call of duty to make sure that a young person who wanted to do a traineeship who might normally have been left behind um, wasn't. And, and Michael won the Equity Apprentice of the Year down here in Tasmania earlier this year. 
again, he's an, uh, an amazing young man, really committed young man, uh, but he does have um, visual issues and, and the things that we helped him with there and the things that staff went out of their way. And again, not just the teacher, this is where TAS TAFE works really hard to provide full wraparound services for our apprentices to make sure that they get the support they need to be successful, of which the learning and learning support is just one component of that. Thanks, Lyndall. The next slide. So some of the things that TAS TAFE's put in place over the last few years to assist apprentices is, is to make sure we have orientation for apprentices now so they don't just turn up to class and or their first day on campus and wonder what's going on. They, they have an orientation program to make sure that they're set up prepared and they understand the difference between carpentry and carpet laying. And, and that's like a nice little joke and something to smile about, but it's really, really important that people know what they're letting themselves in for. I talked a bit about this, um, the importance of learning support and tutor roles for apprentices. So the issues we're having with, with more people coming underprepared for study, uh, that's the same in the apprenticeship space. It's not like apprentices are a different group and they're having these issues. They are, and we need to do that. We're just starting our first um, support group for female apprentices after some feedback from the young woman who's pictured there. Uh, how she, she was really struggling during her apprenticeship, not so much in class, but when they have a break and you're the only female in the group, um, how are we connecting females from other trade areas so as they're, they're getting together in a break and they can provide some support to each other and, and form a bit of a network that hopefully will last beyond just the training side of what they do. Uh, and again, you know, I, I keep talking about this support outside of learning uh, success is not about someone turning up in the classroom and being talked to or getting some online training or being shown how to do something. Quite often, it's about access if they have a disability. It's about supporting the areas that they need support in. And again, in Tasmania, we have a, a, a major issue around literacy and numeracy. And um, I think Ben's examples of how we spell OK and use OK now probably... Um, show that there's not just literacy and numeracy, there's understanding between old people like me and young people. Next slide. Also last year in 2020, Tasmania had the um, Apprentice of the Year and uh, Caitlin Radford has been an amazing advocate for the vet sector and for TAS TAFE, both nationally and here in Tasmania. A uh, little quote from her there, she, she speaks extremely highly of what it is that um, Taz Tafe did for her and how Taz Tafe helped her to, to get where she wants to be. The great thing about Caitlin though is when you meet her at a function and she's probably usually not dressed like that, she wants to talk about what crop she's just planted or harvested or what function she's done on the farm. Her and her, her partner, they're share farming now uh, and, and, you know, she, she credits a lot of what Tafe's done. And we talked a little bit about preparing for the next stage with um, uh, Tiffany, but uh, Caitlin went on, she did Cert 3 in agriculture, and then she went on and did a diploma in agriculture, and she's now looking at what she's going to do beyond that. So I think we really need to understand that, that young people know that the apprenticeship is not always the end point, and that quite often the starting point for where, for where they want to go and, and what I, I think is an amazing starting point. Uh, next slide. There we go, I'm done. So I, I tried to go quickly there, Jenny, so you get a couple of questions in, so thank you. Great, thank you very much. We have run out of time. We, have, we did pack a lot in today. I just want to thank all our speakers, to the Assistant Minister who left us a little bit earlier, to Ben, Really terrific data there, Diane, the pastoral care component. Tiffany, it's really refreshing to see what's happening with the National Careers Institute and thank you for providing that insight. And Grant, fantastic to hear what's happening in one of our jurisdictions and the attention given to apprentices to help them move through their pathway. We are done today. We're a bit over three o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to all our participants for being part of today's session. And this is the last TAFE Talks for the year. We'll be back next year, early in the new year, with an academic integrity discussion for TAFEs around how to actually manage some of those very important issues. Thank you again to all our speakers and good afternoon. <laughs>